Thank you, Armar. Uh, good afternoon. I hope everyone had a good lunch. Uh, today, my talk is about uh, sharing our experience of building a high-performance packet processing platform. Uh, before I talk about the technical details, I want to spend a little bit of time to talk about Alibaba, help everyone know the company better, and uh, this will also help you understand the challenges that the infrastructure team are facing. Uh, with the IPO of the company in 2014, the name of Alibaba is well known by uh, most people in the US. Uh, but I find not many people know about uh, Alibaba's business. Uh, one thing I heard often is that people compare uh, Alibaba to Amazon because both are e-commerce companies. But if you look at their business model, they are quite uh, different. Uh, what uh, Alibaba has been focusing on is building the platform to enable the sellers to sell stuff to the buyers. Uh, on the other hand, Amazon basically is focusing on direct, uh, to deliver the merchandise direct to the consumers. Because of this difference, there's a term that uh, uh, comes out often that in Alibaba's financial report. It's called uh, GMV, uh, gross merchandise volume. So this is the total amount of transactions happened on the platform. It's, good, it's a good indication of uh, uh, how well the platform is doing. In some, some ways, it's kind of similar to uh, Facebook using uh, MAU and uh, DAU to measure the, how well the social network platform is doing. So uh, at the core of uh, Alibaba's uh, e-commerce platform, it's the uh, buyers and the sellers. So what the company is trying to do is that uh, we, they want to connect the buyers and the sellers to make it easier to sell stuff. So when the company first gets started, it started with Alibaba.com. Uh, so this site uh, focuses uh, more on the international business buyers and the sellers. So over the, ti uh, over the uh, time, different forms of uh, marketplaces get uh, developed uh, that are targeting different uh, kind of buyers and uh, sellers. Uh, Taobao.com is uh, probably the most well-known one. It focuses on the small buyers and the small sellers. Uh, on top of this uh, marketplaces, the company also introduced new services to make the shopping experience better. Uh, for example, the Ant Financial Services started as a trusted third-party payment service to facilitate the transactions between the buyers and the sellers. Uh, later on, in order to ensure the delivery experience of the shopping, we also add a logistics, a logistics service. Uh, there's a, as you can see, there's many different services here in the ecosystem. I'm not going to go to the uh, detail of everyone. Uh, just like many U.S. companies that uh, uh, with the growth of business growth of Alibaba, there, we also have a global infrastructure. This is what's available that, uh, uh, through the, uh, to the developers uh, through the Alibaba cloud. Uh, however, there's also uh, some unique challenges that, uh, with our infrastructure team. Uh, for one thing, we have a very diversified workload running on the infrastructure. Uh, for example, our e-commerce platform requires highly reliable transaction. Uh, our uh, 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 financial platform requires extremely high security. The media streaming service also means that we need to push a large amount of data to the end user. Uh, on top of that, we also have Alibaba Cloud, which brings a third party workload into the infrastructure. So how do we build a unified infrastructure being able to serve with such a diversified workload? This is something that uh, always uh, uh, keeps us working. Uh, besides the diversity of the workload, the other challenge that we have is the burst of the workload. Uh, in order to promote the business, Alibaba has uh, shopping campaigns all year round. The most well-known one is, uh, happens on the November 11th. The data is uh, the, called the single stay in China, because as you can see, there are all the ones that are in the, in the date, right? So the people from Alibaba think, uh, well, since all the people, uh, single people don't have anything to do on the single day, let's make this a uh, shopping festival <laughs> so, th <laughs> so that uh, they can buy more stuff. Well, this, uh, it, it sounds like a simple idea, but it's really take off. And the growth of, the being, uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, single day shopping event uh, grew very quickly. So the tables on the right side is the numbers from the last two years. Uh, remember the GMA I just talked about. So this is the total amount of transaction happened on the platform that day. Uh, on 2016, it's uh, 17.8 billion. 
So I did a, this is a pretty big number, but uh, as a comparison, I also did some research during the weekend. Uh, for the most, uh, the busiest shopping period in the US, the five day period from uh, Thanksgiving, Black Friday, all the way to Cyber Monday, the five days uh, total online transaction amount is about 12.8 billion. So it's still a few billions below this number. So this gives you, uh, you guys an idea how big the number is. Well, these uh, eye-popping GM numbers is great for the business, uh, but the, the, the two numbers below it actually is what keeps the infrastructure team up all, day, all night long, because uh, those are the uh, transactions and the, and the payment numbers at the peak time. And uh, those numbers are many, many times higher than the daily average. Uh, to the infrastructure team, how do we support the business growth and at the same time, uh, build the infrastructure to handle this kind of burst. That's uh, some challenge we have to always work on. What I'm going to talk about today in my presentation is about one of the most traditional way how we deal with it. Basically, you build as efficient uh, infrastructure as possible. Just uh, uh, like uh, uh, any internet company, Alibaba has a lot of gateway services. For example, we have a load balancer, we have firewall, we also need a DDoS protection. So what are the, some of the commonality, uh, commonality of those uh, services? First, these services need to have a very high performance because you want to crunch the packet at a very high rate. So here we are not just talking about the performance of uh, line rate forwarding. Because I will show later, it's not that hard. Here, we are also talking about the process small packet because they are the most taxing workload on the system. And uh, uh, the other thing that uh, about these gateway services, they typically have the pretty complex processing logic. And uh, sometimes, uh, most often, you also require the per connection information tracking the, uh, the connection state. And uh, those uh, logic are very uh, complex and different from service to, uh, from service, to service. Last, uh, just like uh, uh, any internet company like a scale out design, so those gateway services, we also want to, wanted to be able to scale out so that uh, when the traffic volume grows, that we just add more instance to the system. So with the number of uh, Gateway services grow inside Alibaba. What we realize is that uh, it's super important for us to build a packet processing platform. What we want to achieve with this uh, platform are two goals. First, we want to, uh, to abstract the hardware abstraction and make it transparent to the applications. Second, we want to provide the framework and the libraries to make it easier for people to write the high performance gateway services. And of course, we want the thing to be very performant. Um, as we all know, any gateway service is, is, is some kind of forwarding device. So what we do with our platform is that we build, implement this uh, uh, standard packet processing framework in, inside of this uh, platform. So when the packet coming in, we first look at the destination MAC. If it doesn't match the local MAC, we will forward this using the MAC table. If it matches, we will deliver this to layer three. Layer three doing similar things, you look at the the, the IP header. If they are not uh, matching the local IP, we will do the uh, forwarding using routing table. Otherwise, deliver this locally. So with this uh, standard uh, forwarding behavior implemented into the inside the framework for a single application, all you need to do is just to figure out where you want to plug into the packet forwarding pipeline and then implement your callback. Of course, in order to implement uh, the gateway services, you also, it, it will be great to have a bunch of libraries. Here, we also provide a bunch of standard libraries, for example, to do the RPM lookup, the hashing ACL, and also very efficient implementation of the stats library. Uh, on top of that, uh, we also have the utilities that uh, to do the mirroring and the dumping, uh, dumping the packet. Those things come very handy to, uh, when debugging. Uh, besides the uh, building blocks of, to build the uh, gateway service, typically you also need a, a bunch of networking protocols uh, that are running on the system. Uh, this is where we have our uh, services within the framework, uh, within our platform. For example, we, we have ways to manage layer two services like the port, the lag, and the VLAN. We also have layer three uh, protocols that are running. 
And on top of that, we provide a, a single uh, command line, just what you get in the router, so that uh, from the single place, you can uh, configure the system and also manage the services. So we talk about that the most important thing for the gateway service is that to be able to uh, process in packet uh, very efficiently. Let's see how we do that. So the first thing we do is that uh, uh, because we are using server-based uh, system, that we want to make sure that we can run all the cores in parallel so that they can run as fast as they can without uh, uh, interfering with each other. The way we do that is to use the RSS from the NIC to hash the different flow of the packet into different queues. And the different queue get delivered to different CPU core, and then it gets processed on the core and then delivered to the transmitter queue. And on top of that, we also want to make every core to be focused only on one thing to do the packet processing. The way we achieve that is to make sure the thread is finitized to the core so there is no contact switch we also disable the interrupt, so there is no interrupt. And we also don't make any system call. So as you can see, all we're doing is just one thing, processing the packet and do it very efficiently. Uh, on top of uh, making the core run parallel, making the core focused on one thing, the other, the other uh, other things we do here is that we use a bunch of standard software techniques to maximize the efficiency. For example, we use a larger page that to reduce the TLB miss. We align the critical data structure to avoid any data cache miss. And we also align the critical code so that uh, make it as efficient as possible. So now let's put everything together that of the different parts we talk about. So this is what the system looks like. Uh, on the data plane side, we have data NICs that uh, receive the data traffic. And uh, here, we also be aware of the new locality of the uh, CPU socket. So different NICs get uh, uh, attached to different sockets. And uh, uh, then on each of the sockets, we have dedicated core that are running the packet processing thread. On the control plane side, we reserve a couple CPU to run a full-fledged Linux and run these uh, uh, standard routing protocols on, uh, uh, in the uh, Linux operating system. Then we have this control CPU where we run a control thread that synchronizes the networking state that we needed for the packet forwarding from the control plane to the data plane. Now let's look at the performance numbers. So as I mentioned earlier, the small packet processing is the most demanding workload for the gateway service. Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, on, the 10 gig, uh, on the Ethernet, the smallest packet size is 64 byte. And according to the Ethernet spec, you also need 20 bytes to pad the packet uh, between, between packets. So this add up about uh, 88, uh, 84 pack, uh, bytes packet. So 10 gig divided by 84, uh, 84 you get to about 14.8 million packets per second. So what we can get on the 10 gig performance is 14.4 million packets per second. So it's very close to the theoretical limit. So on the 40 gig platform, we basically almost triple the performance of 10 gig platform. And on the 100 gig, we double that performance again. So uh, we can get to about 83 million packet per second on our 10, uh, 100 gig NIC. Uh, to put this 100, uh, uh, the, the 83 million packet per second into perspective, this essentially means that uh, uh, you need to process about 5 million packet per core. Uh, divide that by one second, uh, we got a budget about uh, 200 nanoseconds to pro process a single packet. This includes the time from the, uh, from the packet enter the NIC, so goes through the DC PCIe bus, get processed by the CPU, then come out. The whole thing is 200 nanoseconds. Uh, as we all know, 200 nanoseconds is just a couple hundred cycles. And if we have a single cache miss here, it will easily throw off the number. Uh, this, and, uh, this is a different way to look at our performance numbers. On the top of the chart, we basically we have the PPS numbers against the different packet size. As we can see, as with the increase of the packet size, the PPS number uh, gets lowered. And the bottom uh, graph, we show the throughput number against the different, PPS, uh, different packet size. Here, one thing I want to point out is uh, at about uh, 512, uh, 512 bytes packet, we're able to get to the line rate performance. And uh, there's still plenty of room from 512 to the MPU size. That's why I mentioned earlier, it's actually harder to get a small packet of processing PPS than the line rate, right? 
Now we talk about our platform and share some of the performance member. Let's look at one of the examples of how we use this in our, uh, in our network. So we have uh, our own homegrown DDoS protection system built by ourselves. Uh, for a typical work, uh, packet flow, it starts like this. So the packet coming in from the ISP through the peering link. Then our edge router will forward this uh, to our uh, edge router of the data center through our backbone network. And our DC edge router will further forward the packet to the load balancer and eventually get to the web front end. Uh, in, in order to do DDoS protection, what we do is that uh, we mirror the traffic from the peering link and then run an algorithm to figure out that which IP got attacked. Then we issue the command to the uh, control center to say, hey, we need to clean up the traffic for that specific IP. Uh, once we get the, the DDoS protection system get the command, it will issue a slash 32 route into the edge router to bring the traffic into the DDoS protection system. That's where all the heavy lifting happens. After we clean up all the attack traffic, we inject the traffic back into the edge of the data center. Uh, so this is an example how we process the uh, clean up the traffic in our DDoS system. Uh, for example, when we start from the, uh, from the very left, uh, we have all kinds of traffic, in, uh, different kind of attack traffic and also the normal traffic. Uh, so first, what we do is that uh, uh, we, we have uh, maintain a blacklist IPs where we know the attack traffic come from. Then uh, we will just look at the source IP of this packet and filter out these packets. Then a lot of uh, DDoS packet has some invalid packet format. We have packet validation rules to filter out those. There's also the cases where uh, when people doing DDoS attack, they fix the source IP address. Uh, to handle that, we actually use a probe to figure out whether the source is valid or not. For those without a valid source, we will filter that out. Uh, I'm not going to go to the details of all the steps we process the packet. But one thing I want to point out is um, with the platform that we build, uh, the, all the DDoS protection application need to worry about is to it's this kind of logic to deal with the, uh, how to process the packet. It doesn't have to worry about uh, how the packet gets forwarded or how to hook up the BGP sessions with the routers. That all been taken care of by our framework. So as we all know, this DDoS is kind of like a mouse and a cat game, right? So people constantly improve their strategy. And over the years, we developed dozens and dozens of uh, DDoS protection logic. Uh, it's, it's, it's not possible for us to uh, apply all the protection logic uh, uh, one by one because uh, not only will that make the packet processing very long, it also sometimes the different logic may step onto the toe of each other. So the way we solve this problem is through a, uh, uh, to dynamically uh, adjust the, the protection logic. The way we do that is to first mirror the inbound, a small percentage of the inbound traffic to a side system. So remember here, my, I mentioned earlier that one of our building block in the platform is to do the packet mirroring. It comes in very handy here. Uh, once we get the sample the packet that from the uh, mirror the traffic, then we figure out that what kind of attack is happening. Then on the fly, we, adjust, we decide that what kind of protection logic we need to apply, and then set that in our details protection engine. This way, we can dynamically adjust our protection scheme that based on the attack that's coming in. Uh, in the last part of the presentation, I want to talk about uh, where we're going uh, to do in the future. So when we started the packet processing platform, we started with the layer 3 and the layer 4 packet forwarding. Then our user asked, hey, we need to do a deep packet inspection because we want to look deeper in the packet. For that, uh, we Im implemented a, a stateless deep packet inspection, so basically allow people to look into the uh, inner, uh, inner payload of a single packet. Then the user asks, say that, hey, we want to also look at the per connection data that from the, uh, from the user. So in order to do that, because we run our packet processing without uh, any stack, so we implement our own user mode stack. So once we do that, we realize it's actually possible for us to do a, a layer 7 proxy. And, uh, uh, and this is what we're working on right now so that we can handle a lot more uh, complex protocols with our packet forwarding platform. 
So besides getting deeper into the packet, the other thing uh, we are also have to do constantly is to improve the speed of the system. We started with 10 gig NICs uh, as uh, our uh, NIC, and uh, we can pack uh, two NICs, each with two ports, to get to 40 gig throughput. Uh, later on, we added a 40 gig NIC, and with that, we packed four NICs into the system, we can get 160 gig. And uh, next, uh, we, get, we bring in the 100 gig NIC, and with two NICs in the system, that uh, we can get to 200 gig throughput. Uh, this all sounds cool, but it turned out to uh, go beyond 100 gig, there are a lot more hurdles that we have to overcome. First of all, as we all know, that uh, the PCIe Gen 3 bus, the biggest uh, device you can get is 16 lens. This gives you about 100 gig performance. And uh, for the NICs that we have, we have two ports, but it's just uh, there's no way for you to utilize the two ports with this kind of, uh, with the existing PCIe bus. And the second is that uh, while we're ramping up the speed, uh, packet processing speed, uh, the CPU starts getting, uh, becoming more and more like a bottleneck. To work around these problems, what we are working on right now is to leverage some of the NIC capabilities and the programming ASICs to offload some of the packet processing from the CPU and directly doing that in the hardware. Uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, same thing. Question, a couple questions here. Questions by all through here. Hey, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, I don't know if I missed that part, but I want to understand how you handle small packets. Uh, did you simply increase the MTU size, or do you do some kind of aggregation? And if you do, is it in software or in hardware? Uh, so all the packet processing is done in software. We, uh, r right now, we don't do any special trick for the small packets. So all we are trying to do is that we try to make the packet processing as efficient as possible. That's how we get to a very high through, uh, PPS numbers to process a small packet. But, uh, you're, but uh, it's right. Uh, you, it's, uh, the, like I mentioned in the talk, uh, the small packet processing is a lot more taxing for, to the system than the bigger packets. So um. <coughs> you were putting a lot of emphasis on the NIC that you're using. Can you say anything about whether that's a custom design that you specify yourselves, or do you use off-the-shelf NICs that are just very obviously very high performance? Yeah, uh, we work very closely with our NIC vendors that to build the solution that meet our needs, but uh, we don't build our customized NIC yet. And uh, that's something that uh, we have been looking, but we haven't done anything in that direction yet. Uh, hi. Um, my question is, uh, do you use some kind of um, pre-existing uh, DPDK-type framework to do all this, or did you develop it in-house? Uh, yeah, we do use some existing framework uh, just uh, to get the packet directly from the NIC to the user mode process. But uh, everything after that, uh, we build our own in-house solutions. And uh, second question is, how much of PPS can you process per core on on a single Xeon, I'm guessing, CPU? Uh, like I mentioned in the, in the slide, we're, talk, uh, we're doing about a 5 million packet per second on a single core. That includes the full pipeline? Yeah. OK, thank yeah. you. Um, I have a question on the latency of your anti-DDoS solution. Yeah. What's the latency of all those stages you're, you're measured? Uh, it, it, we're talking about a, a, a couple microseconds, and not more than that. But if you look at the DDoS protection system, it actually doesn't matter that much because uh, right. uh, the, the latency is more come from the distance because remember, it has to traverse the, from the edge of our PM router all the way to the edge of our data center. Those typically determine the latency instead of our system. Yeah. Have you ever compared your solution against the existing vendors? Well, like we, uh, actually, I didn't mention that uh, in the slides. We started with the union vendor solutions, but there is a, with the skill of, of the company and also the kind of a, 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 a wide, wide variety of attack traffic, it's very hard for us to use the vendor solutions to meet our need. That's why we have to build the whole thing in-house. And once we build the whole thing in-house, it gives us a lot of flexibility to do more advanced stuff, like the, uh, smartly adjust the attention, uh, protection logic based on the attack types. Uh, so it looks like you use IP tables to all the way in the back. So it looks like you use IP tables to um, 
for your edge services to do NATing and firewalling and stuff. Is that correct? No, we don't use IP tables because uh, IP tables live in the kernel, and in order to get this kind of performance, it's very difficult to do that in the kernel. So, what was that IP table slide about? Sorry, maybe I missed that. Uh, we probably should take this offline okay. because, uh, uh, yeah, we don't use IP tables <laughs> right now. Hey, thanks uh, for the presentation. So most of the traffic is coming encrypted. If you want to do content inspection, you have to decrypt and encrypt traffic on flight. How are you doing it? How do you distribute the certificates from the end system? Uh, that's a great question. Th that's where, uh, actually, we are still working in progress. So far, the DPI that I mentioned in the slides, we are do uh, doing a uh, stateless uh, uh, DPI, so meaning that we just look at the content of a single packet. If it's an encrypted packet, we wouldn't be, be able to do that. That's where we start building the layer 3 proxy. And uh, once we do that, the problem you mentioned is going to come up. Yeah. This is really inspiring. Hi. Um, you mentioned something like a TCP stack, in-house TCP stack on top of DPDK or some kind of similar technologies. Yeah. Do you plan or do you have an open source? Are you open sourcing that or there is there any way to sneak peek to see your achievement? Ah, uh, this is a good question. The, so far, the, uh, we do have an in-house implementation of the TP, TCP IP stack just to get the most performance out of our system. And uh, yeah, we, the Alibaba as a company has a plan also to contribute more to the open source community. This is something, uh, I don't know the timeline, but uh, this is something that we're definitely looking into seriously. Yeah, um, quick question, uh, similar lines, the earlier questions. Uh, do you, have you compared with FDIU, where the similar logic holds good, get the packet to the user space, and then do more optimizations? and doing uh, uh, FDIO, FD.io? Yeah, yeah uh, we look at the FDIO. I, I think uh, FDIO come from the uh, v, uh, VPP from Cisco. And uh, if you, the, their design is kind of very unique. And they batch a bunch of packets packet together and uh, process all the packets in a batch. And some of their core uh, Packet processing code in order to really utilize the, the CPU architecture, they have some very hard to understand the code. I mean, it's a very efficient code, but it's also very hard to understand. Uh, so that's where we have been hesitated to adopt that framework right at this point. Any other questions? What's a sampling? What's a sampling rate for DDoS detection? Uh, I don't uh, remember this on top of my head. If you want, we can talk about this offline. Hey, uh, what, what do you do for management uh, uh, in terms of you know, managing different NICs and functionality? Uh, do you have a homebrew solution for that? Yeah, I mentioned that uh, briefly that in my presentation, for all the services and also the uh, configuration, we have, a, uh, we have our homegrown uh, CRI so that uh, as a command line console so that you can configure all the services and also the different networking protocols that through that single URL. But uh, overall, this is just a server. We manage this as server just uh, as uh, any other service in the data center. Any other questions? All right. Please help me thank Hayong again. Thank you. All right. Thank you.